How many people here uh, write JavaScript uh, on a regular basis? Very cool. And how many people here come from a uh, security background? Anybody? All right, very cool. Uh, so uh, hopefully I have a lot of content that's new for you then today. Uh, so my name is Mike. Uh, this is Tristoff. Uh, we both work, uh, or I used to work in Google Security Engineering Group. Uh, Tristoff still does. And in security engineering, it's our job to provide the tools that, uh, for developers to allow them to produce secure and robust software. So a lot of what we're talking about today is kind of how you can use some of the new tools that we're producing uh, in your day-to-day -day work to make it easier to produce secure and robust software. And uh, we're talking specifically about uh, uh, DOM XSS. So um, if you're using a modern client-side web application framework, DOM XSS is probably one of your biggest security problems. It's a kind of XSS that happens because the APIs that the browser provides to JavaScript to let you dynamically change the page are insecure by default. Um, and so uh, what are the moving parts that are involved in DOM XSS? Well, you have a source of some uh, values from an attacker, and those reach a DOM sync. And so um, uh, mostly the inputs to your system are going to be strings. So they might be strings that you get from a URL. Uh, they might be strings that you receive uh, as uh, data uh, via JSON or some other method. Um, and you know, one example, you might look in uh, window.location. You might grab part of that, and you might make some decision based on that. And if that substring then reaches a DOM sync, you know, one of these powerful APIs like element.innerHTML, uh, bad things can happen. And so, uh, you know, a string is just a string until part of your program decides to treat it as trusted code. Uh, and that's when it can do a lot of bad. It can uh, take user data, phone home with it. It can present um, uh, an interface that you did not expect to present to the user and trick them into doing things they didn't want to do. So, uh, for example, let's say our, our application is running on example.com. Uh, an attacker engineers a user into going to this URL. And then your code looks in location.hash, takes a substring, finds some element on the page, uh, and uses that uh, string as a string of HTML. That string then goes through the HTML parser. Um, it creates an image. The HTML parser then sees this on error uh, attribute, um, which then gets routed to the JavaScript parser. When that image fails to load, that uh, uh, on error handler is called and causes a side effect. So this is, uh, this is the classic case of DOM XSS. And why is DOM XSS so prevalent in uh, modern client-side web application frameworks? Well, there's two reasons. It's easy to introduce. You have to use these powerful DOM APIs to do your job, um, and it's hard to detect. Let's uh, talk a little bit first about why it's easy to introduce. So DOM syncs, there's a lot of them. You know, we've got inner HTML, we've got source attributes. Um, each of these attackers have figured out uh, how to craft payloads um, that let them subvert your program so that it's working uh, towards their ends instead of yours. So uh, the first thing, you know, so you can't do work without these DOM APIs, um, and all of these DOM APIs are vulnerable if an attacker controls the input. So the problem we have is that any code with access to DOM APIs can introduce XSS. Um, and since the DOM APIs are global, that basically means any code in your application. Um, so uh, who can tell me, is this function safe? Come on, this is JS Interactive. You guys can be a little more interactive. Uh, go for it. 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, you have to know how it's called to determine whether it's saved. And so uh, let's say we look through the code base, and the only place it's called is in this function g. So this function g is passing document.body as node, and it's passing y uh, as, uh, as the value for inner HTML. Is this safe now? Exactly, we don't know where y comes from. So let's say we look through the code again, and we find that the only place that g is called is here, and it's called with z, which is the string hello world. So is it safe? Yeah, it's safe. Um, and, and, and the is there is critical. So it's safe in the present tense. If uh, tomorrow somebody were to add another call to the function f or g, um, that situation might change. So we could exhaustively review our code, kind of connect these dots and conclude that it's safe, but that judgment would only be valid for the current version of the code. And so the problem here is that we've got a use of f um, that uses a powerful DOM sync, uses inner HTML, but its security is tightly coupled with all of its callers, its present callers and its future callers. This means that security review is really hard to do. So, do you want to do that? Sure. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so, is this really a problem, though? Is, does this uh, lead to actual vulnerabilities in actual code? Uh, yes, it does. Um, so, I work in the Google security team, and one of my jobs is actually deciding on the rewards for the external people who report security bugs in our software, such that we can patch them and secure our users. And we are talking about millions of dollars paid yearly uh, to research security researchers who find bugs in our code. It turns out that roughly half of the payments each year come to the researchers who find web bugs in our software. That's not really surprising, right? Google has a lot of uh, essentially web properties, web applications. Um, and XSS is by far the um, most uh, prevalent bug uh, from this web category, right? Cross-site scripting is um, uh, responsible for the biggest payouts that we do as part of our bug bounty program. And DOM-based cross-site scripting, which is the one that we are focusing on right now, is roughly right now two-thirds of the payments, right? Uh, two out of three bugs that our XSSs in, uh, let's say, Google software uh, are DOM-based XSSs. So this pattern, these problematic uh, things about the uh, JavaScript APIs and the browser APIs does lead to re real security issues in the, in the code. But this is just our data. Other, uh, other data sets um, still show that cross-site scripting for web applications is a super um, um, prevalent problem, unfortunately. Uh, fortunately, though, we do know how to address this. In Google, uh, as part of uh, um, my team tasks, uh, we were thinking for years now on how to limit that, how to minimize the possibility that you know, uh, tens of thousands of front-end uh, engineers uh, can introduce a vulnerability without even realizing that, because no one obviously uh, wants to create a vulnerable software. And we have found a solution um, that is uh, practically uh, responsible for um, a significant reduction in, num in the number of um, uh, cross-site scripting bugs in our software. And this, this is a software, uh, or this solution is mostly focused on server-side XSSs, which DOM-based XSSs is not, uh, not one of. Uh, but this approach is very successful. And it's so successful that we think it makes sense to port it to the browsers themselves, such that also the client-side XSSs can be protected through this uh, manner. So we are trying to bake it for years now into the browsers themselves, such that you know the JavaScript on the web pages can use our methods of trying to protect the applications against this very bad uh, prevalent uh, vulnerability type. And this is called trusted types. Trusted types are essentially data objects, are types that encapsulate not just the value, but also the security properties of that value. Uh, to give you a very, very short introduction into this one, uh, the core idea behind trusted types is to make uh, the DOM API secure by default 
which we think it is not right now. Uh, because, for example, as soon as you start using inner HTML as a function, you most likely have just introduced a vulnerability uh, if you ever put a user-controlled value into that sync, as we call it. So we try to switch the situation to make the DOM API secure by default um, and strongly typed at the same time. We're relying on, uh, well, JavaScript types, essentially, for, to, uh, to give us those interesting properties. So once you start using trusted types in your application, the DOM syncs, all those cloud of functions that Mike has shown you before, reject strings. You cannot call them with strings, with minor caveat that I will uh, demonstrate later on. Uh, instead, you have to create those typed objects uh, that then can be safely passed to this function. And those typed objects are of different kinds, right? Because we have different contexts uh, of, of various values. So we have a trusted HTML object, which you can safely pass to, for example, in HTML setter or document write function. Uh, we have a trusted script URL object, which you can pass to, say, a source property of a script element. And then we have a trusted script object, which you can safely pass to, say, an eval function or something that directly executes a JavaScript snippet. And once we have those types, uh, we can put so many security rules and controls over it, which is exactly what we will demonstrate in a second. So um, let's look at how to use trusted types uh, in the browsers. Um, yeah, so we have a file here, right? Um, the way you enable trusted types in your application, or the, uh, enable the trusted types enforcement for the DOM syncs, is by using a content security policy. Normally, you would set an HTTP response header, but just to demonstrate it in an HTML file, I just use a meta tag to do that same thing, right? So you have a content security policy, and there's this new directive, as we call it, require trusted types for script. This simply means uh, I don't allow strings to be passed to those sensitive functions. I require a typed value. And just to demonstrate that you know this this solution um, already has some teeth behind it, I will just use it in a Firefox uh, loading uh, a polyfill. We do have a native implementation in Chrome, but just to show you um, the demo on Firefox, right? So this is just loading the trusted type polyfill, uh, and there's something. Don't look at it yet. Ttmagic.js, right? So let's see this one in action. Um, nothing really interesting, right? There's a hello world application, but. What is interesting here is, as soon as I try to uh, have this code in my application that, for example, does this, and this potentially could be an XSS payload, this doesn't happen, right? The page didn't reload the new code, and the content, content didn't appear. We actually got a type error here, uh, which says that, well, come on, with document write, you actually need to use a trusted HTML value. And just to demonstrate that you can use a trusted HTML value with this one, is let's call this magically magic function with some value. Uh, don't look at the magic yet, but essentially, yes, you can use the sync still just with a different value type. And this is, uh, this is the uh, very base demonstration of the API functionality. So uh, let's go back to the presentation, right? Did we actually change anything for security? Uh, because we just, you know, changing the, let's say, the contract of a given function, we're changing the signature of it. Uh, but the very important change that is here, which is actually fundamental, is that when enabling trusted types and having the exact same code here, uh, if we change this Z assignment to magically create a trusted HTML value, the safety becomes decoupled from the things, from those um, you know, dangerous, potentially dangerous functions. Uh, what that means is that when looking at the security, when reviewing an application for security, uh, I can totally ignore all the other par parts of the code. Now, the only lines of code, let's say, only functions, are the ones who create trusted values. These can potentially introduce something insecure, but the rest of the application code base is like completely irre irrelevant for DOM XSS. And this is a fundamental change. Like uh, we, we end up uh, or we move from a state where the uh, API is unsecured by default and very clunky to work with, let's say, um, to a state in which an action has to be deliberate to interact with, with this API. So 
to uh, go back to the example that Mike showed, without trusted types, any code with access to DOM strings can introduce XSS. However, with trusted types, only the code that creates trusted types can introduce XSS, which is a nice property. But then again, I am a security engineer, right? And the way I am reading this statement is slightly different. I'm seeing code creating trusted types can introduce XSS. That's a bad thing. I mean, I don't want XSS. So what can we do about it? Well, uh, we can guard the creation of those trusted values. And we do that in Trusted Types API with objects called policies. Policies define the rules that uh, convert the string values, because in the end, you do read strings for various environments, some of them attacker controlled, uh, and convert those strings into trusted values or trusted types. Let's see a demo. So second thing, not much has changed. We still have this require trusted for script uh, directive in CSP. We have the polyfill, but now uh, we call this specific function exposed um, on the window object, right? Every window now has a trusted types uh, property and the trusted types property uh, has a create policy function. And what we can do through this is, well, create policies. So I am creating a policy named strip tags, which is very similar to what, like, say, PHP did with the uh, strip tags function uh, years ago, right? And what this policy simply says that this policy is able to create trusted HTML objects, but any input to it will be somehow transformed. In this particular case, I'm doing a very lazy HTML sort of sanitization, but not really, just neutralizing the value somehow, right? So I do some prefix. Uh, and then I replace every uh, you know opening bracket to um, to you know an HTML escape of it, and let's see how that works in practice. Oh, and one more thing, this just is a JavaScript object. You or you create it, assign it to a variable. You can use that variable wherever you like in your in your program. Uh, yeah. So let's let's see it. Uh, nothing similarly has changed, but now we can use document.write and then strip tax policy let's say something really bad uh, sorry image source equals x I'm really bad at typing sorry on error equals alert ah oh, let's go 1337 why not um, yeah this will succeed because the, the policy creates trusted HTML values unless it throws then it of course doesn't uh, no, I think I have them, right? Oh, yeah, strip tax policy is not a function, that's interesting. Oh, yes, of course, sorry. You need to call it create HTML function. And there you go. Uh, the document write was called, but actually with, a, with the transformation of the value, which correctly escaped the uh, less than uh, character. Um, what does it show us? Well, first of all, now not only the type creation uh, is uh, the security sensitive code, but we can put rules on top of it. We can define how the trusted objects can be created, uh, adhering to which rules. And of course, you can have seven different policies for different parts of your application with different, let's say, trust properties. And um, uh, different rules can apply to different, um, uh, to different objects, right? So only policies by now can introduce DOM XSS in your application, which is a huge property. Uh, but then again, I, I read it slightly differently. Policies can still introduce XSS, and this is clearly, clearly bad. So let's improve on this. Let's see how we can actually control the policies. Now, seemingly nothing has changed, right? We still have a content security policy. We have the same directive here, but there is something else here. We have a separate directive that is called trusted types, and then a list of tokens, essentially. And this one simply says strip, strip tags. What well, this says that in my application, I'm allowing only the strip tax policy to be defined. Other policies simply cannot be created or policies with a different name cannot be created. So I can still use the strip tax policy that does you know, something, the same, the same logic as before. But let's imagine you have something else in your application. And most, most, most of you already do something like that which is loading some extra code, let's say something that displays an advertisement. And this advertisement is suddenly malicious. So what this does is 
it tries to, well, haha, -ha, create its own policy that does no transformation whatsoever, uh, and then, you know, supply uh, XSS payload through that policy object, right? This is so bad. Uh, this is an intentional bypass, but still a pretty bad situation, right? But thankfully, trusted types protect against that. And once you load this, you can see that this policy, haha, -ha, is disallowed. Your browser, well, in this case, polyfill, but your browser prohibits the policy creation. So you can't just sneak in additional policies here, uh, which is, you know, desirable property, let's say. But also you cannot actually create a policy uh, with the name that was already used. So what was it? Strip tags, right? Strip tags. Let's imagine this one empty object. Yes, strip tax policy already exists. It's already registered, right? So uh, you can only use the policies in your application that already were somehow whitelisted, allow listed in the um, uh, content security policy header. This one, right? So you give even more control over how policies get created. And with that, I will switch back to Mike. Thank you. So, um, without trusted types, any code uh, could assign any value to any sync. Um, with trusted types uh, enabled in, uh, without any policy controls, any code can create a policy to create uh, a value that will pass a sync. Um, and with policy controls, only uh, code that, ha that uh, uh, runs early enough to get one of these trusted names, one of these names in the security metadata, can create a policy. And so this last dynamic really allows a uh, security support team to support a uh, application development team. So how many people here know about GitHub code owners? Um, uh, wonderful. I think. Uh, this is actually probably the most uh, people I've seen aware of that uh, particular feature uh, uh, ever. Um, so code owners is an underrated feature of GitHub. And what it allows you to do is loop in uh, experts when certain files change. So you, you define a file that has a format kind of like .gitignore. So you've got globs over uh, paths in your code base. And then you can say, uh, for this glob, these people should sign off on any changes to it. And so what that lets you do is have the vast bulk of your code, which can change however you like, but this small subset of files uh, uh, requires review by an expert. Um, and so uh, we've got trusted types. We're allowing my policy and my other policy, and we're not allowing any other policies. Uh, whoever controls this header gets to decide um, uh, which policies are allowed, and uh, code owners can guard the files that control those policies. And so what that means is uh, you're ensuring that your policy code is reviewed regularly. Uh, next slide. Uh, next one. Um, so uh, policies at runtime, they're just JavaScript objects, but they're JavaScript objects whose code has been carefully reviewed. Um, and you can use the usual JavaScript language features to define how, uh, how other parts of the code interacts with them. So if you define them inside a, an immediately executed uh, function, then they're only visible to other code in that function. Um, that means that you can define a policy that uh, is would be unsafe if globally available, but is safe based on the callers that can appear in the scope in which it's defined. Um, and you, you know, Tristov uh, uh, gave an example of a policy that auto escapes. So that might be a policy that is uh, uh, should be available to more widely to uh, to a larger amount of code. Um, so it's very flexible. As you have a lot of flexibility as far as how you craft these policies and how you expose them. Um, and then once you're doing the review, uh, these are some, some best practices that we've kind of come up with. So uh, you don't want to depend on global state. 
Um, uh, and um, when we are, uh, when you're kind of making decisions about what to allow and what not to allow, you always want to be whitelisting. You never want to be blacklisting. Looking for bad patterns when writing uh, security relevant code. Um, uh, it's very hard to reason about everything but. Um, it's much easier to reason about only. So, and I think when uh, trying to craft a security mechanism, it's, it's worth kind of explicitly stating what it is that you're providing. So uh, what Trusted Types does it, uh, is it allows you to make arguments kind of like this. So uh, we, the application development team with our security support people, um, we're producing code that is secure against DOM XSS uh, because DOM syncs only accept Trusted Types and only policies can create those types. And the sec uh, security experts have reviewed all that policy code um, and, and hopefully they're you know, good at their job. And uh, we restrict policy changes to a small, not infrequently changing subset of the code. So those uh, reviews can be thorough. Um, and uh, the, uh, so if it were the case that every developer was writing policy code and it were frequently changing, we wouldn't get much benefit. So we need to keep the amount of security sensitive code kind of isolated and small. And I worked in Google Security Engineering Group for uh, six, seven years. Um, and I was uh, heavily involved in uh, improving tools and libraries. So I did a lot of work on things like template languages, sanitizers. Um, and I was on a team that, you know, we took rotations. So every couple months, I'd spend a week reviewing all of the changes to policy code across Google. So there was a team of about 10 people supporting a development group that was, I think, close to 10,000 engineers. Not all of them were involved in web application uh, work. But a small security team was able to uh, scale to a large application development group uh, because um, the uh, number, of, the amount of policy code was actually fairly small. Almost all of the policy uses are in some common infrastructure. And nice thing is that, you know, the nice thing Trusted Types does is we don't have to reason about uh, where things come from. We don't have to reason about where they're go going. You know, a small security group can kind of focus all of their attention and a security engineering group can focus all of their improvement effort on this small core of policy code. So, uh, and so uh, what, what happens now is um, code doesn't become vulnerable because somebody makes a mistake in application code. Um, kind of introducing vulnerability is, you know, like uh, what we saw after several years of working on applications like Gmail was most of the XSSs uh, were my fault um, or somebody in a function like me, not the common application developer's fault. Um, so uh, the system is flexible enough uh, that it's possible to bypass. This policy code has to be correct. And this allows it to be a good migration target for a lot of applications. So we've built enough flexibility in here. Um, if you've got an application and you want to create a legacy policy that just converts things, get, trust, get it working with trusted types, and then later tighten that down, you know, kind of remove the need for that legacy policy, you can. And so, uh, you know, and it's possible, it's also possible to bypass this system. So if, uh, if there's some dodgy code that runs before the policy that defines the before Tristoff's uh, policy that defines the strip tags policy, and it gets the, uses the name uh, strip tags, uh, then it might run first. So you have to do a couple things like make sure that the trust the small amount of trusted code that defines policies runs early in your bootstrapping process. Um, and uh, I mentioned 
kind of tools and frameworks as key integration points. So a small number of uh, policies account for almost all of policy uses. Uh, template systems, sanitizers, and builder APIs um, account for the vast majority, and that lets a small team kind of uh, work on rotations to review the remaining ones. So, uh, talking about, we have time to talk about integrations? Sure. Yeah. So, we spent uh, years kind of uh, working on our own internal infrastructure um, to make sure that there's high quality libraries and policies available to uh, Google code. We don't want the uh, web development community as a whole to have to recreate that process. So we've been working um, on a basic set of integrations that, that mean that a lot of this trusted type stuff should actually be transparent to the, the bulk of developers. So Facebook has integrated trusted types into React. Um, and I think you need to, it's on, in an experimental mode right now. So you need to uh, uh, set something in your React feature flags um, to enable it. But then React is aware of and respects uh, uh, trusted types. Um, so you know, just using React with trusted types turned on unless you're doing something kind of odd that requires one of these safety hatches. It should just work for you. Um, and uh, tools like Don Purify, uh, .sanitize can now be producers of trusted types. We know that Don Purify with a wide set of configurations is, uh, is, uh, produces HTML that is safe because it strips out things like script tags and all the other uh, dodgy parts, so we can trust. Uh, so when it produce, it it uses a policy internally to create a uh, trusted HTML value. Um, and yeah, so if you want to know more, um, this is a link to go to. It has a lot of information about trusted types. Uh, trusted types is available in Chrome now. Um, Chrome has an intent to ship, so it's right now it's, it's hidden behind a flag, um, but it should be coming to Chrome uh, by default soon. In the meantime, there's a polyfill. Uh, Firefox hasn't uh, decided yet, uh, that hasn't committed to shipping yet, um, but uh, you saw uh, uh, in, our, in the demo that we loaded a polyfill and that gave us the benefit of, of trusted types in the browser. Um, and there's a mailing list that you can look at. The specification is currently before the W3. Yeah, so trusted types at googlegroups.com. Uh, we'd love to, uh, to deal with your questions there. Um, or you can look us up on Twitter. So uh, any questions? In the back. So the question about was about uh, integrating, well, essentially building an HTML sanitizer in the browsers. Yes, there are um, there there are plans of having that. It's not that easy because essentially it turns out that sometimes HTML sanitization needs to be customized to the application, and the amount of the customization knobs is just like staggering. Um, but Firefox. Uh, as far as I know, plans to start experimenting on something like that Q1 next year, and uh, we are also looking forward to that. Uh, we actually, yes, also are thinking that robust HTML sanitization is not an easy task, and it, it's up to the web platform to solve that as well. Yes. Uh, you had a question, I believe. Yeah. 
uh, yes, it's it's all about the uh, example being too simple. For me. So uh, one thing that I've we found kind of in in doing this is it's best to do the conversion as close to where we know why something is safe as possible. That usually mo means moving the uh, trusted value creation earlier in the process. Um, and so by the time you know this value reaches F, we've lost the context. By the time it reaches F, all we know about it is that it's, in a, it's stored in a variable named X. We don't know that it's a string that appears literally you know, in the source code. So here we can reason this string was written in the source code by a trusted developer, therefore we can trust it. But we, we lose that context once, oh, once it's there. Yeah. Um, so, so how to get back to like the context yeah. application. Yeah. One of the nice things about this is, you know, uh, by automatically checking at the sinks, that means, and, and having a mechanism for explicitly uh, make, you know, ex uh, making uh, trust decisions explicit, um, we can move those trust decisions to where we have the most context. <laughs>